Okay. So we're going to do a half an hour class. And as I said on Moodle, I'll combine what's left in Marcuse with um, Brilliant next week. And we'll also do long presentation, well, longer on presentations next week. And we'll have it all looked up. I think we should be good because I don't want to, I don't want to lecture to a student walkout. You know, because, hey, I, I'm going to go to some of the walkout, but, but also, I mean, I wouldn't anyway, but especially when it's on Marcuse, because he was taken up by that in both the New Left and um, the student movement in the 60s, so that would be like, that would be disrespectful to both students and to Marcuse. Uh, <clears throat> some people asked me to go over the paper. I'm going to do that for about five minutes. I'm going to obviously post the slides afterwards. Did I hit play? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so look, the second paper is pretty much like the first. It's longer. Um, it's 2,500 words, which is about 10 double-spaced pages, counting like 250 words per page. And you can either pursue the same concept from the first term essay, or a new concept from five of the 10 readings. One of the things I did, because somebody asked me if I did this earlier on is I put Nietzsche on second term as well because we covered it, even though it was carried over from first term, we covered it the first class on second term. So you got Benjamin, Cesar, uh, Fanon, Heidegger, Nietzsche, Schmidt, Sorel, Virilio, and Zizek. And in terms of the essay two assignment, this is what I'm looking for for an A, okay? Um, that you cover five of the 10 course readings are used to discuss whatever concept you choose, we'll just say technology. Um, or it could be power, it could be time, it could be anything, right? So you know, if you're, looking, if you're thinking of power, you would probably go to somebody like Schmidt, Fanon, Nietzsche, and then it depends. You could look at really all if you saw power as speed, you could look at, you can make different ones work. So the paper should have the equivalent of an introduction, um, an essay body consisting of one or two paragraph, a one or two paragraph discussion for each of the five readings, addressing the key aspects that inform or relate to the chosen concept. The readings can be compared and or summarized. If they're summarized, then a paragraph comparing and critically engaging them is needed. Prior to the conclusion, and this is like a new sentence, or a, a new sentence fragment, Prior to the conclusion, wherever you feel it fits in the essay, there should be a paragraph linking the essay with the two-minute film. The essay should end with the conclusion. The essay requires references and a bibliography. The reference style can be MLA Chicago APA. Um, there's a Scott Library link to these styles. And the style must be consistent throughout. And then sentences using correct punctuation and grammar are expected. Now it's due, as you can see, a sliding deadline from April 1 to 16. Um, I, I'm not opposed to extending that deadline. I, I, whatever seems to work better for people, but I need to do it for everybody. I thought the 16th would be good, but I don't know when the, how it works in terms of your exam schedule. Um, so I'm more than happy to stay with the 16th. It's probably better for me, but if you need it extended to the 20th, tell me now um, and I will, I'll ask next week as well, but I will extend it. If that makes sense. Yes, Jordan. Just for me personally, I already know I have like two of my exams that week, or three of them. So, so what are the, what's the, the exam schedule runs like? I always get this mixed it up. It runs until the 19th, or the 20th technically, but it's a Saturday. So what if I give, what if I change the due date to the 24th or 25th? That would probably be better for everybody. Is that better for everybody? Because I can do yeah. that and I'll make it known, and I'll repeat that because to me, I'm so busy doing other stuff. Like I'll grade them when they come in, but it's not like I. It's, it's like, just. It's just. It becomes very hard, at least for me, to like. Absolutely. Time management wise, like uh -huh. I want to put more time into my exam or an essay, and then when a due date comes up, it's like kind of gets stuck, and then you feel like you're missing out on studying and stuff like that. Yeah. No. No. That makes a lot of sense. And I mean, thanks for that, Jordan. I think everybody else in the room thanks you too. And that's not a problem for me at all. In fact, I don't think I'm even in town on the, on the I'm, I'm out of town from the 18th to the 23rd or something, right? So that's perfect. So Greg, thanks to Jordan and others, what I'm doing because of the exam period, 
and I should have been on top of this, but I wasn't paying attention. I would have done it to begin with. Um, I'm extending the due deadline from April 1 to April 25th for the essay, and I'll put that on the I'll put that on the Moodle site. Um, this is going to be posted. I think it's fairly clear, but if there's any quick questions on it, I'm happy to answer it. Or if you want to talk to me, if you want to come talk to me, I'm around. Email me. Excuse me. Um, and maybe just make sure I'm going to be in my office when you want to come see me. So I'm going to do now, because, because the, the student walkout, I'm going to do a very fast lecture on Marcuse. And I want to make sure I know what time it is. OK, we have, actually, we have time. I think I can do something good in about 25 minutes. OK, Herbert Marcuse dates 1898 to 1979. His last book was on aesthetics, and I believe it was 79 when it came out before he died. So Marcuse was a student of Heidegger's. He broke with him over Heidegger's Nazi party membership. He immigrated to the US in 34. So he worked for the US government um, doing uh, translation and stuff, because his first language is, is German, was German, uh, during World War II and immediately after World War II. If you've read the Frankfurt School, he's, he's a member, one of the key members of the Frankfurt School. Um, Marcuse taught at Columbia, Harvard, Brandeis, and uh, University of California, San Diego. And if you see the picture down here, um, he was a mentor of Angela Davis. He taught Angela Davis political theory, which is pretty awesome, because she really got political theory well. And so and he's considered the father of the new left and also really a mentor of the 1960s uh, student movement, not only in the US, but also in France. Um, he was at, he was, I think he spoke at May 68 in France, which is another reason why it would be very disrespectful to Marcuse, and not just you guys, to actually lecture at him while there's a student walkout going on. So having said that, what I want to do in today's mini lecture, so his, one of his most famous books, 1964, one Dimensional Man. The essay you're reading, which is collected in Technology, War, and Fascism, was written in 1941, some social implications of modern technology. It becomes the basis for his discussion of technology in One Dimensional Man. I will do some quotes from One Dimensional Man, sort of enhance the essay. Now remember, it's written in 1941, about sort of six actually not six years. Heidegger did a lecture on technology that wasn't actually published until 49. And you read the 54 version of it. So they're very contemporary on their writing on technology. Contemporary with each other, not contemporary with us. Um, what Marcuse, on, in the essay you've read, in some social implications of modern technology, what he's doing there is he's developing his ideas in technology that are going to be set out in One Dimensional Man, and he's developing them from his interaction with Heidegger. Um, in 1941, he really kind of, his understanding of technology contemporizes Heidegger's distinction between inframing and poesis even though Heidegger's lecture is actually published later, Marcuse has a much more contemporary understanding of technology, I would say. So he, Heidegger's distinction between inframing and poesis, Marcuse contemporizes this and applies it to advanced industrial society. He talks about unions and unions being co-opted in, in the piece you read. Marcuse says that in terms of poesis, aesthetics, art, Art cannot change the world, but it can contribute to changing the consciousness and drives of the men and women who could change the world. So art cannot change the world, but it contributes. So he's, he's picking up in poesis here, and he's saying, art cannot change the world, but it could contribute to changing the consciousness and drives. He's also a Freudian. So you've got three really strong mixes in Marcuse. You've got Marx, probably number one. You've got Heidegger and you've got Freud. So art cannot change the world, but can contribute to changing the consciousness and drives. Uh, so if you read Eros and Civilization, which is on psychology and politics, um, it's the instinctual drives of men and women that could change the world. 
So I'm just going to review a little bit. And I'm going to do this quickly because our class goes to top 30. I'm going to review a little bit Heidegger's two conflicting tendencies in technology, then to get to Marcuse. So of course, from last week, the dominant tendency of instrumental technology, that's the danger in technology, that has come to the fore as corporate, techno-scientific, and techno-war economies, that's one tendency. The other tendency is towards poesis. The revealing and saving potential inherent in technology that you find in critical reflection for Heidegger, that you find in poesis, uh, that you find in art and aesthetics. So for Heidegger, in framing is the instrumental approach to technology, that orders, controls, structures our way of interacting with and reproducing ourselves in the world. This is just a quick summary. The real danger of modern technology for Heidegger is that we can't think beyond in framing. The problem for Heidegger is that our thoughts, our ideas, our understanding of being, and I would say, as in um, the world and beings in the world, that these are stuck in a way of thinking that simply challenges for them. There's no critical reflection there. It's this way of thinking that keeps us in the position of what he calls standing reserve, that is on call, waiting for engagement with the next technological requirement. Now, for Heidegger, he says there's another way to think. This is the way of poesis, and at different places he, he calls it reflective thinking, which is what you read. He also calls it conceptual, commemorative. It's, it's a different way of thinking and action that brings forth something not obvious, not codified by in framing. And Heidegger says, this lies in art. Now, if you go back to Marcuse and Marcuse's quote on art, Marcuse agrees with him. He says, art can't change the world, but it can change our consciousness and drives. So then, what does Marcuse say? <laughs> So Marcuse says he begins some social implications of modern technology by presenting a technological version of Marx, Marx's understanding of labor, Marx's understanding of the means of production and the mode of production. And he says, and this is how he defines technology. He says, technology is a social process, techniques, that is the technical apparatus of industry, transportation, communication, that's only a partial factor. That human individuals are an integral part and factor of technology. That we as humans invented machinery, we attend to it, and we are the social groups which direct, which direct its application and use. So you can see how he's kind of updating Marx's understanding. He's talking about machines. He says, we invented them, we attend to them, and we are the social groups which direct technology's applications in machinery and its use. Now, it's 1941, so he's talking about machines, because that sort of is the newest technology. Makes a distinction between techniques and technology. So techniques is the technical apparatus, or it's a technical aspect of industry, transportation, and communication. It's like, in a way, techne skill um, for Heidegger. And like this, it can promote authoritarianism as well as liberty. It can produce scarcity as well as abundance, and it can abolish or extend work. That is, techniques is not, it, it can be articulated with different modes of production, different developments of technology. If you were going to use Heidegger, it can be articulated with technology as framing and technology as poesis. Now, technology for Marcuse, he says, as well as being machines or instruments, this is on page 139, 
He says, technology is a mode of organizing and perpetuating or changing social relationships. It's a mode of organizing and perpetuating or changing social relationships. It's a manifestation of prevalent thought and behavior, and it's an instrument for control and domination. And that's on page 131. That's how he defines technology. And he stays with that definition, and it only increases in one dimensional man. The, if you wanted to go to Heidegger, the enframing part of technology for Marcuse, which he sees as, so he sees that technology is a mode of organizing, perpetuating, or changing social relationships. In modern technology for Heidegger, the way is in framing. Um, and it's a manifestation of prevalent thought and behavior, and it's an instrument for control and domination. It depends what technology is articulated with, what kind of mode of production it, it develops in. He offers some hope for the liberatory or the liberated potential that's there in technology, much like Marcuse. He says, it's inherent in thought and behavior. It's inherent in what Heidegger calls human reflection. It's inherent in the, the poesis aspect of technology. What Marcuse does that Heidegger doesn't do, and why we like Marcuse so much, is he couples it, he couples human reflection with action. And he comes to call this critical thought. So he takes Marcuse's critical reflection and he couples it with action and he calls it critical thought. He argues, Marcuse argues, and I'm just going to go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. He argues in 1941 much like Heidegger's understanding of framing, that a new rationality and a new type of individuality have come into being as a result of new technological process. That is, individualistic rationality gets transformed into technological rationality, which he later calls instrumental rationality. That is, the very rationality of technology Scientific rationality makes for a specific social organization because it projects mere form. And he says, what is that form? Well, it's formalism and functionalism. It's in framing. So for Marcuse, and so he says, look, the liberating force of technology, the instrumentalization of things, that is the objectification of one's, to go back to Hegel, Marcuse is also very influenced by Hegel. Um, so if you go back to Hegel, the instrumentalization of things, that is the objectifi objectification of yourself in your labor, turns into the instrumentalization of man. So he, he couples Hegel's objectification into the external world with Marx's understanding of alienation and Lukács' understanding of reification that we did first term, and it's the instrumentalization of man. So as you're, the way that you're relating to the world around you, the technology you're using, if it's an instrumentalization, um, if, it's, if, it's an, if it is an instrumentalization of things, then it becomes the instrumentalization of man. So you can have an objectification of self into things in terms of what you're creating. If this is done in terms of an instrumental form, um, the form that, that Heidegger would call in framing, it turns into the instrumentalization of man. So you know, you're alienated from your product, you're alienated from using it, you don't have any say in what makes it. It's what, what Marx calls alienation from the object of labor, instrumentalization of things, which then becomes an instrumentalization of humans. So Marcuse says towards the end of the question concerning technology, so long as so that's Heidegger. What Marcuse says is domination perpetuates and extends itself not only through technology, but as technology. And one could argue, um, as we were doing in the discussion last week, that this, this happens more as we become, become more integrated with our technology. So thus the picture of zeros and ones. 
and all our technological devices. So Marcuse said domination perpetuates and extends itself not only through technology, but as technology itself. That it affects the way we think. Now, towards the end of Heidegger's question, quite the question concerning technology, and this links up with Marcuse's understanding of domination, he says, so long as we represent technology as an instrument, we remain transfixed in the will to master it. So these two kind of go together. OK, we've got 10 minutes. Now, what Marcuse says, he says that truth, and he talks about <coughs> truth. Um, he says that, that truth has been split into two different values and patterns of behavior. One ends up being assimilated to the apparatus, and the other is antagonistic to it. So the standardization of thought that comes about with technological rationality prohibits, inhibits critical thinking. It inhibits reflection. And so the question then is, how do you think outside of technological rationality? He says, in, in One Dimensional Man, how do you think outside of the reality principle of techno-capitalism, in which, in which the irrationality of scarcity and production deadlines, etc., is seen as being rational? Well, what he comes up with, drawing on both Heidegger and Marx, is he says that this can be penetrated, that you can penetrate the reality principle of techno-capitalism in which the irrational is rational through critical theory, which is premised on what he calls negative thinking. But you can do this through negative thinking. That is thinking against. <clears throat> and not being co-opted into this system. Marcuse talks about how the um, AFL that they, that they ended up, rather than having critical thinking, that's the American Federation of Labor in 1941, ended up being incorporated into the technological apparatus itself. So for Marcuse, critical thought is negative thought. That is thought that thinks against the existing technological apparatus in which you live, in, in which your ideas and self is framed. You know, thought that Heidegger would call reflective thought. So you've got the beginning of this in some social implications of modern technology. He develops this further 23 years later in One Dimensional Man. And he says, and I'll read you a quote from One Dimensional Man either today or tomorrow, depending on the time, or next week. He says that, that critical thought, negative thought is oppositional. It thinks against. It, if, you, if you have something you think sort of against it, you don't take it as for granted. The aim of critical theory for Marcuse is twofold. One is to figure out and define the irrational character of the reality in which you live, of the established reality. And secondly, once you've done that, to try and figure out what tendencies cause this rationality to, to generate its own transformation. So first you have to define the irrational characters, the character of the, of the reality you exist in, and then define the tendencies which cause this rationality to generate a transformation, which is not easy. I mean, it sounds good. We haven't successfully been able to do it on any sort of uh, large scale. So then, it gets complicated. Because he says the critical, the critical theory of society possesses no concepts which are going to bridge the gap between present and future. This is from One Dimensional Man. It holds no promises, and it shows no success. It remains negative. It remains negative because Marcuse, being influenced by Nietzsche as well, right? 
it, it remains negative because Makuza says it wants to remain loyal to those who, without hope, have given their life to the great refusal. And I think that is actually a good place to end, so I'll just flip to the, the student walkout. Um, and there's five minutes left, so that was a very fast lecture. We can do five minutes of questions or clarifications if you like. If anybody's got anything yet, um, Miriam. I was just wondering what the, where the previous slide came from. That previous slide comes from One Dimensional Man. Oh, okay. Okay, so I wanted, so it's One Dimensional Man, OD, uh, on page 257, towards the end of One Dimensional Man, where you're gonna look at, so he's, where you look at the great refusal. So if you've got a PDF, uh, just search the great refusal. Because that becomes really important. It's a good question in terms of negative thought. He hasn't got there in 1941, 23 years earlier. Okay, so he's working, he's working towards that. He's saying, okay, critical thought is thinking in opposition, it's thinking against what you know. It combines reflection with action. And then he also gets to the great refusal by just, okay, so a walkout's a great, as part of a great refusal, right? It's like, you will not be in class because your tuition is extremely high and you don't get any, um, you don't get any grants anymore, you just get loans, right? Which then makes you in debt to the system for on and on. Anything else on that? So Marcuse has, I'll, I'll just say one more thing. Marcuse has really brought together, because he really is a continental uh, thinker who has influenced the sort of new left and radical left, um, and he's really brought together, I mean, you can, see, you can see thinkers in the course coming together, like Hegel's section on um, independent and dependent consciousnesses, Marx's work on alienation, and, and his work also on reification that we kind of trace through Lukács. Um, you can see also Sorel turning up there um, a little bit. You can see his, his debt to Nietzsche. Um, you can definitely see his debt to Heidegger and what he does with Heidegger and how he very quickly at the very beginning of the, of the piece interjects what Heidegger misses, just like that. And that is he interjects action. He interjects the, the, uh, a Marxist understanding of the, of the mode of production. So you've got, you've got Hegel, Heidegger, Nietzsche, Marx being brought together in Marcuse's work. Okay, I will end there. So I'll post this, and if anybody has, I mean, please don't stay and don't feel